The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. We're coming to you live from the Warner Center in Woodland Hills, California. This is the home for the Center for Autism. It is also the home for Autism Live. We are going to be with you live for the next two hours talking about some pretty amazing topics. I always try to bring you great guests. I've got oh, 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 great guests this morning. So um, in fact, we've got so much programming that I got to squish the beginning here a little bit. So want to remind you, lots of experts on the show. I'm not one of them, but it doesn't mean that I don't care passionately and uh, I want to help you to get to the resources that you want. Samantha's going to show you some of the different ways that you can connect with us here on the show. We are fully interactive. We're on YouTube. We, are, we were a little bit broken on Roku for a while, but we're back on Roku. <laughs> <laughs> so check that out. We're on Periscope, Twitter, of course, on uh, iTunes, and you can get that podcast and choose whether you want to watch it or whether you just want to listen to it. Uh, and we are always on our homepage. If you go to autism-live.com, we are getting a retool on the website. It's coming very quickly. And But for the moment, if you click on the triangle on the computer screen, it starts the show playing, whether it's the live or the previous, the most recent recorded version, right? And to the side of all that, um, there is a series of white boxes. If you put your cursor in the box that says your question, your comment, you can talk to us and have complete and total anonymity. And it's totally free, by the way, everywhere that we are. We, uh, so having said all of that, we like to start Thursday mornings with something that I fondly refer to as the jargon of the day. You know I love this. Because uh, we take one word, one phrase, one acronym, and we break it all down. We give you the actual definition, we make fun of that, and then we give you the working definition so we can begin to figure out what the heck do these things mean and why is it important to learn them. So, we, you know, beginning of the year, we go back to basics, right? And so this is a word that we throw around a lot. We want to make sure you guys know what it means in relation to autism. So here we go. I'm all, always on the wrong side. My Carol Merrill is wrong. There we go. Antecedent. There it is. Da, 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 da. What does that mean? Uh, okay, so our actual definition, and again, this is in regards to autism and ABA. Antecedent is anything that occurs or is present immediately before the behavior of interest. All right, that's not that, there's not much to make fun of there, but you know, I mean, it's a little dry. Let's, let's make it a little bit more accessible. Our working definition and antecedent is what happened before. And this is really like, you know, getting down to basics that um, this needs to be a, become a part of your everyday uh, living, not just jargon. So you go to pick up your child at school and they say, well, you know, we had a rough time in English today. This should be the first thing out of your mouth. What happened before? What happened directly before whatever happened, right? Start asking these questions and you'll find that sometimes it's very elucidating. Other times you're like, okay, well, because a lot of times people will say, well, nothing, nothing happened before. That's not true. That means they weren't keyed into whatever happened. And look, we, do, we can't have eyes on everything all the time, right? And sometimes we will miss something, but there's always something that happened before, before the behavior. I know when you're new to the autism community, it just looks like random behavior that happens out of nowhere. Somebody wrote to us the other day and said, what do you do about a kid who uh, is like a coin flipper? And I thought, the first part of the sentence, I thought, oh, they flip coins all the time. And they said, one minute they're happy and the next minute they're upset and that it seems unattached to anything. It isn't, though. It may be that we can't see what it is because it might be something that's happening on the inside, right? Um, but something 
changed. And we have to kind of become Sherlock Holmes to figure out what it is. The thing about antecedent is once you start to understand, okay, something happened before and you start to look for it, you get empowered because you can take control over that. So often we don't have control over the behavior. Once somebody is in a behavior, it's really hard. And, and the larger they are, the harder it is to get control of it in the moment. But we will talk about antecedent strategies to head off meltdowns, tantrums, antecedent strate strategies to get somebody set up for success. Oh my gosh, if we can change what happens the moment before, sometimes we only get behavior that isn't a problem. Woo, how powerful is that? So antecedent, it's what happened before. And even if you don't remember the word, the, the word antecedent, just start putting it into your everyday uh, living. To, whenever something happens, go, what happened before? Just practice it on good behavior. What happened before? Practice it on nothing behavior that's neither good nor bad, right? And figure out what happened right before that. Oh, something always happens. It's going to blow your mind when you realize it. Okay. Uh, moving on, we uh, always have a question of the day, and our question, talking about antecedents, is what's the first thing you do every day? What's the very first thing you do? Now, some people I know open their eyes and they bound out of bed and they're like, mm, right, <laughs> ready to go. This is not me. I don't know about you guys, but it, I am so, the older I get, the slower I am to, to get up. But I'm thinking in the morning, and you know what they say about what you think becomes what you say, becomes what you do, becomes what you are. So, you know, I have to take responsibility for if, because if I lay in bed and I go, oh, I got to do that today, right? That sets me up for not success. Uh, that set, sets me up to trudge through my day. And I can take responsibility for that and say, you know, what do I want to be thinking in the morning? But my question is for you, what do you do uh, first thing every day? I have a friend who, you know, gets up and makes herself a tea and sits and reads the LA Times in her backyard with all of her animals and her lovely, and that sounds lovely to me. That's not my life, right? <laughs> and I got to get a teenager up and out the door. Um, but we all can make decisions about what we'd want to be the first thing of the day and does it set us up for success. So write into me, let me know what you do first thing every day. I lay in bed and think. Uh, okay, so then we always have a topic of the week and I love this topic this week because it's all about fresh starts. You know, I used to be, first I was a college professor and then for a while after 9-11, I was a classroom teacher teaching junior high and high school. And somebody said something to me once that sticks with me. Uh, out of all the things that everybody ever said about being a teacher and how to be a good teacher, one of the things that I remember the most was no matter what went on last week, every week there's a Monday and it's a new start. And you can say it's Monday and so we're going to do it a different way. It's Monday and, you know, here are the new rules. It's Monday and here are the new objectives. It's Monday and here's the new mission. It's the beginning of the year and a lot of times we attach a lot to that and say it's a fresh start. Well, the truth is, is that every Monday can be a fresh start. If you've been doing something that isn't working, you can start over. And it doesn't even have to be on Monday. You know, we can institute Fresh Start Thursday or Fresh Start Friday or New Beginning Saturday, right? It can be whenever you want. I am a victim of sometimes I just get so driven of, oh, we're going to do it and we're going to do it this way because I think that's the way to do it. And I am that fly that hits itself against the screen and never realizes, oh, if you turn around, there's a whole place you can fly. Um, so I don't know if you're like that too, but every once in a while it's good to go, wait a minute, am I beating my head on the screen? Do I need to like stop, look around and take a new fresh look at this? It can be really, really exciting. And especially where autism is concerned, because there's so many avenues you can go. If what you're doing isn't working, you don't necessarily have to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but you can institute fresh start today. I give you permission. Um, in case you needed it, and if you didn't need it, it's okay. Uh, do, what you, do what you will, move about the cabin, but fresh start, we can all do it. Uh, okay, speaking of that, oh, 
our guests today. I'm very excited about this. First up, we have Dr. Matthew Lerner, who's going to be joining us from the State University of New York at Stony Brook. So excited to have him on the show. He's going to be talking with us about that study that we mentioned yesterday, uh, where they're spending 2.99 million, just under three, um, on three on three different campuses to study the Sense program. So Dr. Lerner is the lead investigator at one of the three sites at Stony Brook. He's going to talk about how he, the very interesting route that he took to get to this point, I think it's, you're going to love it. And uh, then we have Bonnie Yates is going to be here and hopefully she's going to answer one of the questions that we had yesterday. Plus we're going to continue on uh, talking about this, the topics we were talking about last week. And then we're going to round out the show with a very special guest. First time on the show, Lee Grossman. What a history he has had in the field of autism and used to be the president of the Autism Society of America. And wait till you hear what he's doing now. And you know, we always love to talk to an autism dad and get their perspective, but this is an autism dad who's been in this for a while. And to get his perspective on the things that he's concerned about in the autism community and where he sees the autism community going in the future. So I think you're going to love this show. We're going to take a quick break and then we've got to get right to Dr. Matthew Lerner. Stick with us. Inclusion is everything. Feeling like we have a place where we belong, and when I say we, I'm first and foremost a mother, a mother of a child on the spectrum, and not, and gym owner, and now founder of carrying this to families who need it as well. My son is extremely hyperactive. Getting him to calm down is a very difficult task, so the idea of Brock the Spectrum Gym, where he could just go and run and play and do all these fun things without any kind of worries and just go, 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 and bring down that energy, it just it helps us so much at home. You know, in the home or at school, it's not acceptable, but this is the one place it is acceptable for the child to kind of be themselves and get it all out there and just really just be their, themselves. It's an amazing place where my son could go and be himself. Um, you get to meet other parents who are in the same journey as you are. I think the most popular aspect of it is how they include all children of all types. Not just all only learning disabled, lower functioning, moderate functioning, high functioning, and non-disabled. Uh, non People there are so friendly, everybody's like family, they always greet you with a smile. There's not one negative thing I could say about any of the employees, they're all absolutely amazing. I think every parent should walk in through those doors and see what an amazing gym it is. Now a diagnosis being one out of six kids are in some way or form affected with sensory processing disorder or autism. That's why We Rock Now is on the rise. People want to be a part of it. People know that they have a community there. They know that they can learn more information about things that they don't know themselves or that they can share, build friendships, and uh, basically get what you get in an OT facility, but it's not $150 an hour. It's 12 Welcome back to Autism Live. If you watch this show at all, you know that I love whenever we can supercharge our kids' social skills, and you know that I love theater. And our next guest is gonna talk about how we're putting those two things together to make amazing things possible and some research that they're doing to show how amazing it is. So we wanna to welcome to the show for the first time, but I hope not the last time, Dr. Matthew Lerner. He's joining us from, he's an assistant professor at Stony Brook, State University of New York at Stony Brook. So Dr. Lerner, I'm, I'm all a Twitter. I'm, I'm so excited uh, to have an opportunity to talk to you about this because it's two of the things that I love most we're talking about theater and we're talking about social skills. But before we talk about that, I want to talk 
specifically about you and your interest as a clinical psychologist in this whole idea of social skills and supercharging them, because you've got a very special place in Stony Brook um, where you're working on these kinds of things. So first of all, welcome and tell us why this is your interest and what it is that you're doing in your place that they call the Learner Lab. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much, Anna. It's really a pleasure to be here um, and to have a chance to speak to you and, and uh, your audience about some of the stuff uh, that we've been doing around here. This is you know, near and dear to my heart and my, my life's work. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I've been interested in uh, sort of this topic for uh, more than 20 years, actually, in, in uh, one form or another. Um, and uh, I, I kind of got into this, actually, um, originally, even before that, after, uh, after college. Um, I had been uh, working, uh, sort of volunteering for a while with a young, young man at the time, uh, since he was two, actually, um, with autism. And uh, I graduated from college, actually, um, having studied philosophy and music, and of course, as a philosophy and music major, not having a lot of marketable skills to speak of, but I was interested in autism, I had worked with one, and so I started working in uh, social skills programs, um, and I was really excited uh, to have the chance to do this, um, because uh, I was, um, I wanted to sort of see what the experts did, what do the experts know, um, and I remember working in my first uh, group with a group of, of teens on the spectrum, and my job was to sit them in a room and tell them uh, rules for the summer. That was the, the main thrust of the approach that was being used. And what really struck me was that there were some kids who really grasped hold of this, loved this. They said, yeah, yeah, tell me more. I, I want to know. And then there were other kids who really didn't. Um, they would get kind of frustrated with me, they would say, you know, don't tell me, don't, I don't want to sit around spending time tell, learning about things that I'm not good at during my summer, I want to you know, have some time off. Um, and so we kept trying to think of other ways to help those kids feel engaged, for things to feel meaningful uh, to them and, and interesting to them. Um, and so at the time, actually, I was living, uh, you'll appreciate this, uh, I was living with um, a couple of friends of mine who were actors. And seriously. They're the best um, roommates. Yes, they really are. They were great. Always pay, always pay the rent on time. Um, and, uh, and we were up one night having a conversation, and I was sort of telling them I was struggling to connect with some of these kids. And I was describing, they said, well, what are you trying to do? And I said, well, you know, it's, it's tough because we're trying to help these kids to be able to um, not just do things that look social, but really connect, right? find ways to understand other people's perspectives, find ways to you know, regulate their responses so that other people will want to continue to talk to them right? rather than, um, than walk away, uh, find ways to um, uh, be engaging and interesting and unexpected um, because that's what teenagers do, right? That's what they want to do. And uh, one of them kind of looked at me and said, well, well that's improv. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? And we started talking about it, and we started, 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 started thinking about it. I had done a little bit of work in improv prior to that. And um, we, I remember staying up you know, late into the night, feverishly writing down activities and, and games and, uh, and things that we could do uh, to, um, to, try, to try to adapt improvisation techniques and principles for these kids on the spectrum. Uh, and we're having a tough time. So I went in the next day, and I went and talked to my group leader, and she was kind enough. Uh, again, I was a young kid in my 20s, and I was, uh, uh, she was kind enough to say, sure, yeah, give it a try. And so we tried. And, uh, of course, I wasn't taking any data on efficacy or outcomes. I wasn't you know, a scientist at this point. I, was, uh, I just wanted to help these kids and wanted them to, to enjoy some of the time they were spending with me. Um, and... Uh, we actually put on a little play and, that they wrote, and, you know, people, kids stop throwing chairs at me. I can't say any other, you know, larger outcome. I'm not going to make, you know, claims that we change their lives, but I can certainly say 
uh, when we were doing these activities, kids seemed more interested and engaged. And it was, it was really interesting, right? Because what we were doing is giving them the opportunity at least to engage on their terms and engage in the things that were interesting to them. You know, we could, we could set up a scene or we could set up uh, an improv game that was based around what, whatever it was that they wanted to talk about, whatever they thought was, was interesting, rather than me, me saying to them, well, look, today we're talking about going to the cafeteria, and I don't, you know, it doesn't matter if you had a bad time in the cafeteria, that's what we're talking about. So, you know, that seemed to be an inroad. And uh, what happened after that was, was kind of interesting. I started working in, in uh, in-home early intervention uh, for some time uh, with kids on the spectrum. And uh, the mother of the young man uh, on the spectrum who I'd worked with uh, for, for since he was two years old, he was a teenager at that time, uh, he she came to me and she said, you know, he's having a tough time in all the different programs in the Boston area. I was living in Boston at the time. And, uh, and she said, well, what are we going to do about this? And I said, what do you, what do you mean we? I don't know. What, what, what can I do about this? And she said, well, you know him. And you did that thing at that camp once. Uh, what if we start a camp? And I said, I don't, I don't know how to start a camp. <laughs> um, and uh, she said, well, why don't you just you know, take that idea and build it out? And I was fortunate for um, I ended up writing a grant. Uh, I ended up working with a wonderful, um, brilliant uh, clinician by the name of Karen Levine, who's uh, one of the most well-known, well-respected uh, autism clinicians in the Boston area. Um, and an organization uh, then called the North Shore Arc, now called the Northeast Arc, was kind enough to sponsor us. And we created a program called uh, Spotlight. And Spotlight was essentially this same model, uh, but brought to scale. And I actually hired, no joke, uh, the people in the first cohort of staff for Spotlight were special education teachers and actors, just that. Um, and actually more actors than special education teachers. Um, and trained them essentially in this approach of, of uh, you know, how do we adapt the tools that we use to teach people theater uh, to help kids with autism be able to find their way in the world. And we initially recruited uh, all kids who had been who had not had good experiences in the other programs in the Boston area, and they came to us. And again, at least they had a good experience. At the end, they all reported having a good time. Nobody got kicked out, um, and uh, everyone said they wanted to come back. And at the end, they made a movie. They they all made a movie together that they um, wrote. Um, they uh, they sort of did the cinematography. Some groups directed it. Some did star in it. They made music and a couple of, of plays, short plays. Uh, and that was fun. And uh, it was actually supposed to be a one-off, but then actually a woman by the name of, of Luann Larson, who was my, my boss at the Northeast Arc, came back and said, you know, all nine of these families have uh, come to us and said, um, can we do this year round? And I said, well, sure, let's give it a try. And so the program started to grow and we, um, we went from nine kids to 27 kids to 71 kids in the course of about six months. Uh, we were um, embedded in school districts, more than a dozen districts around the Boston area. Um, we uh, were doing after-school programs, summer programs, vacation programs, uh, in, in services and trainings and clinics. Um, <clears throat> and it was kind of running this, this, whole, this whole model. Um, and uh, after doing this for a few years, I had what I, I call my, my crisis of science. And uh, the crisis of science uh, was basically this, that, you know, this all felt good and kids seemed to enjoy it. Uh, but the question was, uh, uh, what are we really doing here? Is this really helping more, the things that, you know, that, that we want to affect? Um, is this as helpful for kids' ability to social, socially connect, as you say, to supercharge their social skills? Um, is it more effective than a really good after-school program at the YMCA for 20 bucks. Because if it's not, kids should spend their time in the YMCA program for 20 bucks. <laughs> um, and I thought, you know, but I didn't really know how to measure that, how to, how to address that question. I, and I thought, you know, also there are some kids, this wasn't, wasn't for everyone, some kids liked it, some kids didn't, but how could we predict that? And how can we use that information to make the program better and to hone in on the things that work the best? And then also, how can we get this information out into the world in a way that is fair, in a way that is not, that, that's accessible, that's right, that's not uh, very expensive to, to families all over the country. Um, and so I actually sort of left the pro program, program is still, still running right now, and it's doing, you know, doing very well up in the Boston area, but I left it for uh, an academic uh, research uh, career, which you know, led me through 
all the different steps and you know, ultimately to running my lab uh, uh, here at Stony Brook called, I mean, called people with Stony Brook call it the Learner Lab. Um, like we call it the Social Competence and Treatment Lab or Skittle. Um, we do not have any sponsorship from Skittle at this point, Skittles, but uh, maybe we'll ask one day. Um, <clears throat> and essentially what we're trying to do here uh, is exactly the thing that uh, I set forth uh, to do when I left Spotlight, which is to try to look at uh, all different kinds of programs, not just you know theater-based programs, but all different kinds of programs uh, aimed at understanding and, and improving social uh, competence and say, um, do they work? Uh, how do they work? Uh, using all different kinds of measures. We use uh, EEG and other brain-based measures. We look at how kids are doing in school, both socially and, uh, and academically. Uh, we look at parents' reports and teachers' reports. We look at how kids do in novel social settings. We, we hold pizza parties and give, uh, let kids have these opportunities to try these things out. Um, and then we use that to try to better understand where social challenges are coming from, how kids are understanding the world, and then how to use that to better tailor what we're doing to the needs of the kids we're trying to help. So that, uh, I don't know if you want me to pause there for a moment. Well, you know, it's all so exciting to me because you're singing my song here. Um, yeah. I absolutely love this. And I, and I love that you've got a place there where not only are you doing the things that you're finding work, but you're checking to make sure that they do work. Because we need to have people like you because the actors will run around and they'll go, well, it, it seems like everybody's happier and more productive. But for you to be able to say, yes, but this is what's working and this is why that it's working helps to get funding for more programs to happen so that we can get to that equitable, equitable that you're talking about. And I love that there is more and more research that's being done on, on these subjects. And you are involved in something right now that's called SENSE. Tell us what that is and what you're getting ready to do. Absolutely. So um, <clears throat> importantly, while well, I just told you uh, my story, I was, I'm far from the only person to have had the epiphany that uh, acting training might help us learn something about how to do a better job of, of helping with social skills. Uh, a number of folks have, have had this, this uh, realization. A number of women, I mean, Laura Gooley, who's down in Texas, uh, Kelly Hunter uh, in England, uh, uh, Cindy Schneider and Amelia Davies who have written books about this. Um, but um, one uh, uh, wonderful person, and, and in some ways maybe, you know, the, perhaps the leader of, of the field uh, in, in this area, is a, a, a professor by the name of, of Blythe Corbett at Vanderbilt. She's a, an associate professor uh, over there in the Department of Psychiatry. And uh, she is a well-established uh, autism uh, researcher. Um, she looks at things like, uh, like cortisol and stress hormones and, and how those things happen uh, or unfold in adolescence and autism. Um, she, as I said, she used to work, she, she works at Vanderbilt. She used to work at the UC Davis Mind Institute. <clears throat> but she also has had a longstanding interest in, uh, in theater and um, has actually you know, been an actress at, at various points in her career as well. Uh, his written plays, um, and around the same time that I was starting Spotlight, actually, she was developing this model called Sense, and Sense is um, is similar to the approach that I described in that you know it's about uh, capitalizing on um, the techniques of, of theater training, but uh, it actually even goes a step further and really focuses on every time actually you know creating a play. Um, they, they literally will create a, a play from, from start to finish and the end of the 10 weeks of the, the program, the after school program, is, is a true production in the community. And it's truly community embedded. Uh, they're, they're, it's a peer mediated approach as well. So typically developing peers um, also are participating um, and are also getting uh, the, the theater uh, training experience too and all the benefits of that. Um, but again, you know, we're in, they're integrating um, well-established and evidence-based core principles of, um, of, uh, of, of behavioral techniques designed to improve uh, social challenges, along with all of the really cool benefits of being involved in theater. So Blythe uh, has um, been a pioneer in studying these kinds of approaches. She's done a series of um, community-based trials, uh, randomized, initial peer randomized control trials, and um, I'm pleased to share that we um, recently uh, received a large, what's called R01, um, multi-million dollar, four-year multi-site grant from the National Institute of Mental Health to study uh, the SENSE program. 
um, here and, and at Vanderbilt with, with Dr. Rod Corbett and at uh, Virginia Tech uh, with Dr. Susan White. And um, we're all people who have uh, done social programming for kids on the spectrum for a long time. Um, uh, uh, Dr. White, uh, Susan White has done this in uh, more cognitive behavioral based approaches uh, and is now moving into the, the theater realm. And of course, I'm really excited to get a chance to do uh, the Sense Theater program. And uh, what's really neat about it too is, as I said, it's, it's uh, not only a chance to you know, study this uh, rigorously in the lab, again, we're using brain and behaviorally based uh, measures to, to examine uh, what's going on before, during, afterwards, follow up, um, but also to really work with our local community. So um, the, we're going to be partnering uh, with our local school district uh, that Stony Brook uh, is in uh, to uh, host the actual um, events and uh, to allow us to, to use their theater and we'll work with them uh, in the community to, to administer the program too. So it has this, this kind of great knock-on effect of, of not just trying to um, help the kids who have these challenges, but also uh, perhaps to destigmatize autism a bit in the community. And then for uh, folks in the area to, to look and say, hey, these kids are really good. This is, these are, these are not, uh, you know, halfway shows. These are not just shows that are there to, to make people look and say, oh, look, look at them try. They're doing real theater. And uh, they, we hope, um, we'll see, uh, maybe improving uh, their social competence as well. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some nuts and bolts in, in the program. Um, when are you yeah. actually starting? Who is going to be involved? Like, are you putting feelers out to the community? You said you're working with a school. Will there be yeah. auditions? What's going to happen? Yeah, great, great question. So uh, it's actually, it's very interesting. It's actually a, 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 a true randomized uh, trial in that we have sense as one condition and then we also have a different condition that, that kids uh, can be in, both of which are sort of active things that we believe to help. That's kind of what's novel here. Is it's not just being compared to sitting on your hands and waiting. Um, so um, people can come uh, sign up. We have a, a number of families, several hundred families uh, in the Long Island area of kids on the spectrum who we reach out to participate in studies. <coughs> Any of them can uh, join. There's also members of the local community, um, both uh, typically developing kids and kids on the spectrum uh, who can participate. Uh, we are putting out feelers. Uh, we're going to be uh, uh, putting ads in newspapers. Um, we're going to be uh, advertising on the web. But essentially, we're going to say, come on in and join us. Uh, and we are hoping to be uh, beginning enrollment over the next maybe month or two. And then beginning in, we're hoping uh, April, March, April, uh, we're going to be starting uh, one of the two conditions. Uh, as I said, one is sense. Uh, the other one is something called tackling teenage, which is um, a approach for learning about some of the challenges of adolescence and um, pubertal development um, that happen uh, for for uh, kids on for all teenagers. Uh, but designed really for kids on the spectrum, talking about things like dating, talking about things like how your body changes, or how do you know if somebody's uh, interested in you, and how do you know if you're interested, and, and how do you respond in certain ways. These are this is sort of another domain of, of uh, social challenge that isn't exactly what we're focusing on in sense, but is also something we believe that um, many uh, families and kids have told us they, they need. We don't just believe it, they, they told us this. Um, so our hope is that that way we're providing um, a service and a benefit to everyone uh, who enrolls, no matter what. So that process, as I said, begins over the next couple of months. We run our first set um, beginning in, uh, in March, April, and then our second uh, over the summer. And then we'll be running this for four years. So essentially families can you know, continuously uh, enroll. And, and what's great is, uh, of course, it's free. Oh, that's amazing. I, that was going to be my next question. What is the cost? Now, is there going to be a third group of teenagers that you compare that don't get these social skills with? Yeah, it's a good question. So at the moment, there's not. Uh, and this is because, actually, as I said, uh, Blythe has done uh, the wonderful work leading up to this, in which she's done those studies before. So okay. there are people have published on this. She's published on this a number of times, showing compared to nothing, um, sense helps with you know, kids being pro-social, kids' ability to understand and take uh, each other's perspectives, ability to read emotions, 
Um, so now what we want to understand is something more specific, is you know, doing this sense theater program um, uh, certainly seems to be better than just sitting around doing nothing. But is that, some, is that special? Is it unique and specific to this kind of theater-based approach? Or do you just get it because you're getting out of the house and you're doing some activity uh, with others? Which, of course, is the huge question that, you know, again, has been on my mind for, for 15 years. Um, and it's really exciting to be involved in a project with you know, wonderful colleagues where we actually get to start to try to answer that question. I just think this is so smart. And I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm curious to know what you think you're going to find. And I don't know whether that's an ethical question for you at this point. But I, you know, I, I've, I've certainly talked with Dr. Temple Grandin about what she thought helped her when she was a teenager to, to, to help her to be able to do the things that she's done. One of the first things she always cites is theater. And, mm -hmm. and in talking to her mom, her mom said something that just rang so true with me that she said, well, you know, we all have to find our tribe. And if you don't have a tribe, your ability to try social things out and succeed diminishes greatly. Mm -hmm. And theater uh -huh. creates a tribe. We know that for sure. I don't Absolutely. know that taking a social class does, but I know that theater creates a tribe. Absolutely. And we've, I've, I've seen, we've seen that all along. And it's, it's one of my favorite kind of knock-on effects of using this kind of, a, a, of approach is because you're giving all these kids the opportunity to kind of interact in their terms and allow their quirks to be their quirks, right? Just like we let typically kids, typically developing kids, have their quirks be the things that allow them to connect. Um, this can, can create that sense of tribe. I, I'll never forget the very first time I, I ran the Spotlight program, one of the kids uh, in that initial group I told you about came over about halfway through and tugged on my shirt and said, hey, Matt, and I said, I said, what? I said, uh, where did you find all these kids? And I said, what do you mean? They're, they're all from all around the area. Why do you ask? He goes, this is the first normal group of kids I've ever met. Mm. Isn't that and it's so powerful. And first of all, again, I think it highlights your point about um, you, know, you have to find your tribe. But also, I think it's so important to use approaches that give kids and adults, frankly, on the spectrum, the opportunity to find their place in that tribe yes. <laughs> and to see that tribe as theirs, if they want to, right? We've also, I've certainly also had kids come and say, you know, I don't know, I don't want to do this. And right. it's, it's up to each, each individual person. But I think, I think creating ways that people can figure out what their place is in the world and who they feel good with, um, that's what it's all about. And I, and I so resonate with your point that, um, I, I suspect that theater uniquely gives us this opportunity. And, and actually, to, you know, to your point about what we think we're going to find, um, I've done a, I did a smaller version of, of the study that we're describing now uh, here uh, at Stony Brook recently. Uh, uh, much, much smaller. The, the sense study is going to be hundreds of kids. This, is, this was about 50. And um, we compared uh, my intervention, the, the spotlight intervention, it's called Starry, um, to kind of an active group where kids were doing kind of recreational program. And uh, I don't want to spoil it too much, because uh, the paper is coming out soon. Uh, but one of the things that we do find, actually, is exactly that, that over the course of that time, when we ask, just ask kids, you know, do you want to play with each other again? Do you want to see each other again? Uh, who in this group, do you have people in this group who are your friends? Uh, people who are engaging in these, specifically in these theater-based activities, seem to be saying yes more. Teens seem to be saying yes more. Well, I know that one of the things our, our audience uh, <laughs> are asking is, what's the chance that we can get something like this in our community? Is Spotlight or Sense something that you guys already have a manual that if somebody wants to take it and replicate it someplace else, is it possible? Can they get trained? Yeah, yeah, so that, those, are, those are excellent questions. So um, what I can tell you, first of all, I mean, the good news is, there are manuals for things like this. So as I said, um, Laura Gooley, Dr. Laura Gooley, who's down in Austin, Texas, has a great book called The Social Competence Intervention Program, or SCIP, um, which is a very similar model. She actually did it, created it for her dissertation, and, and frankly, I think it looks a lot like uh, Spotlight and Starry. Um, a woman named uh, Sydney Schneider, a woman named Amelia Davies, both have, have uh, similar books. You can buy them on, on Amazon. Um, and so those... So, so certainly for folks who say, I want something, right? It's not that there's 
nothing else there. But I think this is where um, both both uh, uh, Blythe and I um, have tried to um, really think carefully as scientists, uh, which is to say that there's, as you know, you know, if you Google social skills books in Amazon, you get hundred, maybe two hundred uh, options at this point, and only a fraction of those have ever really been studied. Only a fraction of those can truly be called uh, evidence-based. I have a number of them over here, actually. Um, and um, I think both of us share the goal of ensuring that, our, you know, rather than having sort of more horse races and more things for people to buy and be confused about, that we want to make sure that what we're putting out is meets the highest standards of empirical science. Um, that we are that by the that when you know these models uh, are becoming more uh, uh, distributed, when you can finally you know pick up a sense manual or a starry manual, um, that we can you know have that really crucial section in the front where we say, here's the data that suggests this will help. And I want to even go a step further and say, here's our guess about who it's most likely to help. Yeah. Uh, I love that. But if this is a four-year study, does that mean that you're not going to publish for four years? Or are you going to have points along the way where you're going to publish? We should have points along the way. And importantly, there have been, pub there have been publications along the way in the, in the research literature about this model. Uh, the other thing I can say, too, is that you know there are ways to, to get uh, trainings. Um, you know, I have uh, colleagues uh, who we've trained who now are, can go around and, and do these sorts of things. It's, it's not quite formalized. It's not uh, like one of these, these big network models like some other approaches have. Uh, and again, that's, that's because we're being cautious. Um, but, but certainly, um, you know, we're not just uh, going to keep our lips zipped for four years. I hope not. I really <laughs> hope not. That would be cruel. Um, and, you know, it's that thing of reinventing the wheel. I, I, I know that a lot of people have been doing this. We live here in Los Angeles, and we've got um, amazing uh, theater groups for teenagers here. Um, but for people that are in the middle of Idaho and have, you know, and they're saying, hey, wait a minute, what, what can we do here? I want to make sure that people get access to things. That's what we do here. So don't sit on it too long, Dr. Lerner. But we think that this is amazing. If people want to know more about Spotlight or Starry or Sense, where, where can we send them? I know that we want to send them to the Lerner Lab, uh, which is LernerLab.com, correct? That's right. And, and people will see, people are going to drool because you've got a lovely website there that talks about a bunch of things that you're doing and you have more things there that are just than just for teenagers. I, w I was looking at your site and going, man, why don't we have this here? You, you got a study right now about spousal support? Yes, that's true. Yes, one of my, uh, one of my students um, has, is interested in uh, trying to understand you know, what a parents need to be able to get the support that they need to to address the stresses that come along uh, with being a parent. It's very I, hard and it can be hard for kids on, parents and kids on the spectrum. It's, yeah. it's, your website is drool worthy. Uh, for an autism parent, you look at it and you go, oh, that's, oh, I'm so glad they're studying. Oh, look at that. Look what they're doing. Uh, and you've got some performances think, lists on it. Yes? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I think one thing that, that we really prior, uh, pride ourselves on, and it's something that I would say also, again, by Corbett, who uh, was my colleague, uh, who I mentioned, who's leading the study, as well as uh, Susan White at Virginia Tech, I think one of the things we all have in common is we all try to do research that is uh, community-informed and, and community-driven. So what I mean by that is uh, when I, I've been at Stony Brook for five years, and I spent my first two years here, we were collecting almost no data. We ran almost no studies. Instead, uh, I was out in the community meeting uh, with parents, whether it's giving a talk to a parent-teacher organization or meeting with you know four moms uh, in a basement with some uh, lemonade and cookies, um, and telling, sharing them with them what we wanted to do, but also listening and saying, what do you need? Because every community is unique in terms of its needs. And so the research program we have built here, and this is also true at Virginia Tech, it's also true um, at Vanderbilt is really based not just on our interests as scientists saying we think this is cool and important, uh, but but based on what those families have told us matter so much. And I think it gets to the point of you know this this question of of uh, the theater being really unique is this is the this program uh, families have been excited about it everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> it didn't matter where we were. Yeah, uh, and you know, we're we're really trying to respond.
Well, I, you know, as I said, I appreciate you're, you're doing the science, crossing the T, dotting the I, because that's going to make a huge difference in funding. But a lot of us already know that this is an amazing thing, that this has the ability to help, if not all, then certainly a lot of our teenagers to access social skills in a way that's really effective. So I know you're going to find out for sure, but I already know. <laughs> So, we're, we're trying, I think I think what we want to know though is 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 why and how and when and for whom all the really nuanced questions. Um, you know, one of my uh, you know, the biggest inspirations I think in this field is actually a colleague of, of uh, mine uh, now at George Mason University named Talia Goldstein, and she studies the effects of theater on social development and social cognition and typically developing kids. And she'll you know go and, and work with you know a hundred uh, you know four year olds in a low income classroom. And you know she is she's thought more about this issue than probably anybody on the planet. And I love working with her because what she she keeps saying she's yeah you know, she's been an actress and worked you know, worked in theater work we work, we've worked with major theater organizations uh, together. And you know what she said is you know we, those of us who work in this field have had that that kind of intuition. But one as scientists uh, we always need to to uh, check our intuitions and yes. see if the data supports them. But also you know, we need to be able to go further than that. And we can, we can, what we can do with data, the sort of magic of, of, of really good science is you get to, to peel back the veneer of what just looks like it's so and look underneath and say, well, what's really going on? And, and who is really benefiting? And how does this differ over ages? And one of the things that she's shown is that um, she's shown benefits, for instance, of participating in theater programs for, you know, four-year-olds, eight-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 15-year-olds. But the benefits are really different in each age. And that has to also then be true if we're talking about kids on the spectrum. So now we can actually learn about what makes it uh, uh, work uh, for each of those age ranges. And again, you know, my goal, my, my, my dream is like an evidence-based menu, I love uh, it. right? You can bring in your eight-year-old and say, I've got these 10 things that I've, I've done a 20-minute assessment with your child. And I can tell you, of these 10 things, here are the four of them that are most likely to be helpful. And now let's work together and figure out what, what he wants the most and what you want. I absolutely love it. Again, we want to tell people to go to learnerlab.com, but I do want to mention again that Stony Brook is just one of the three sites where this is going to be happening. So the other one is at Vanderbilt, and then the third one is at Virginia Tech. And so if you are in any of those areas, you want to be uh, contacting folks to know how you can get your child involved. Four years worth of studies. We love that you guys got the funding. Great. Three years worth of study? I thought no, it was... No, no. Four years worth of studies, but they're all, but it's free. Oh, free, free. I thought yeah. you said three. Yeah, yeah. free, amazing. Uh, we, we, we love free, uh, uh, but we love effective more, and I think it's going to be yeah. both. So, um, again, look, uh, there are articles right now about scents, and we'll put some links on our website, too, and on our Facebook page so that you can find in all three places who to connect with to get your child started. Dr. Lerner, thank you so much for all of your work and thank you for being with us. I look forward to having you back on the show to talk about what happens further down the road. You got it. I'll come anytime. This has been, this has been great. It's been really wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, stick, stick with us because when we go to break, I want to talk to you about something. And for all of you, we're going to take a break and then we're going to be back with Bonnie Yates, special education attorney, after these messages. So stick with us. Hi guys, welcome back to Smarty. This month we're going to be creating recycled crayons to help us make some scratch art. While we work on this awesome activity, you'll notice that these icons will pop up. These icons tell you important information about the skills we're using and where to find them on the skills program. <sighs> skills is an ABA based online tool that helps parents create curriculum for the children that are on the autism spectrum. And if you're already a skills user, you're going to get the most out of this fun activity. Well, let's get started. The materials you'll be needing are old crayons, muffin tins, white cardstock, painter's tape, paintbrush, black tempera paint, laundry detergent, shallow bowls, and some barbecue skewers. Inevitably, anytime my niece comes over and we draw, we end up with a bunch of broken crayons. No problem. I'm going to take these broken crayons today and we're going to peel off the paper. 
Once they're peeled, you're gonna place them in a muffin tin or some small container, and you're gonna have the oven preheat to 150. You're gonna put the crayons in there, and they're gonna melt for about 15 to 20 minutes. As you wait for your recycled crayon to cool, now it's time to prep your cardstock. You're gonna take your painter's tape and you're gonna line the four sides with it. Now that my recycled crayon has cooled, I'm gonna have my child fill in the cardstock, leaving no corner left unfilled with the crayon. I'm gonna take my black temper paint and put it in a small bowl with a little bit of laundry detergent. I'm gonna mix that together. Then you're gonna have your child paint over their crayon drawing. You wanna make sure it's completely covered in paint. Let it dry and do a few more coats if necessary if you can still see the crayon underneath. I've been really patient and now the paint is finally dry. I'm gonna take my bamboo skewer and draw a picture on here. You're gonna use your bamboo skewer to scratch away the black paint to reveal the colorful crayons that we used underneath. This is a time for your child to get as imaginative as they'd like. Here's my completed picture. I hope you had fun creating one on your own with your kids. Well, until next time guys, craft on, bye. To find more about skills and to access all of the lessons you saw in today's Smarty, visit skillsforautism.com and click on the parents icon, Skills, the online autism solution. Welcome back to Autism Live, and we're so excited because joining us right now via Skype is Bonnie Yates, special education attorney. She's joining us uh, courtesy of the law firm of Hirji and Chow. We adore her, and we adore Hirji and Chow. Welcome back, Bonnie. Want to give us the disclaimer and information about Hirji and Chow? No, I'm thinking of having like a temper tantrum like a two-year-old and saying, I want to do the craft project that you were just doing instead. Both, both uh, Bonnie and I were geeking out over the craft project going, oh, that looks like fun. I want to do that. Uh, um, I love that. I'm right there with you. Let's go, let's go okay. play with some crayons. Sometime in 2018, we will play with let's crayons. Let's do it. Let's okay. do it. I have a lot more to say about that. Anyway, yes. the disclaimer <laughs> is... The disclaimer is that we are going to answer your special education legal questions, and we do so um, relying on California law primarily because I'm licensed in California, and secondarily because uh, IDEA is a federal statute. It applies in all the 50 states. So in your state, if you're not in California, the same answer might be true as under California law but it might not. So we're giving questions, you know, general answers under California and federal law. We're also telling you, you know, it's not a haste makes waste situation. If you have a particular special uh, legal problem with regard to your child's special needs or IEP, you should consult a lawyer in your own state because they will be much better able to address your specific problem. And so, so that's the disclaimer. And we love the disclaimer. But having said that, there was a question that we had yesterday during Ask Dr. Doreen. Both Dr. Doreen Grampy Shea and I commented on it, but we both agreed that we would be very interested in hearing your opinion. It was from a parent. Uh, it, the conversation came up about a three-year-old and what they were doing with a three-year-old. And at one point, Dr. Grampy Shea said, well, uh, or maybe it was uh, maybe it was a different question. They were talking about ABA in the classroom, and and she was saying make sure that your child has a full ABA program that you know uh, that they're doing things in the classroom, and then you're doing things at home. And and so somebody wrote in and said, how do you get an ABA uh, program in your classroom, especially when they have told you that your child doesn't need ABA and that what the teacher is doing is enough. Um, mm -hmm. And that kind of set off a firestorm in my head simply because of the word choice of enough. Um, and, and so we did talk a little bit about the Supreme Court case and the de minimis, because uh, enough kind of yeah, tweaks yeah. me. <laughs> okay. Well, I think it tweaks everybody because, you know, it, it, its interpretation will be playing out in the courts. Uh, we don't really know yet. Um, Andrew says you have to give more than, you know, de minimis help in a given year, um, but it's it's clearly not a maximization kind of a proposition, so figuring out where the sweet spot in the middle is is something that the lawyers are, on both sides are going to be arguing. But in the specific instance where your child needs ABA in the classroom and the district says they're doing enough, 
I mean, that just sends me down a complete and total rabbit hole, and I have to talk a little bit about what's happened in the last 20 years. So the LOVAS study was quite a, a while ago, right? It was 1987. So for all intents and purposes, it's 30 years old, which is mind-blowing. Um, and so the LOVAS study was groundbreaking in that it introduced everybody to this notion that ABA could have a profound effect on the development of a child with autism. And when I came into sort of the autism wars, it was like 1994, because my child was four and he had just gotten diagnosed with autism. And at that time, there were really very few categorical public programs in public schools for kids with autism, and there was clearly no teacher training specific to autism. And we started going in to classrooms and asking for ABA. And we started getting ABA in discrete circumstances because the district would lose because they had no autism program. So with a lot of these things, there was, you know, kind of like, it was like the new frontier, right, or honeymoon or whatever. And then the district started saying that, you know, no, we're not going to do this. We don't want to pay for it. And we don't believe in this notion that you have to have applied behavior analytic treatment. We don't buy that it's a state-of-the-art treatment. We have an eclectic program. It uses the best of a lot of different methods. And when you would, you know, take them to task about this, of course, they didn't have any validation studies, um, and they didn't really have, um, you know, they were looking at other programs like TEACH, um, TEACH was a big one, and then it would just sort of be like whatever they kind of made up. I mean, it was, and so then we started having all these challenges to programs on the grounds that they were eclectic, and this would have been in the 90s. And then what you saw kind of around the, the beginning of 2000-ish is that districts realized they were going to lose on a eclectic program. And so they started to say that what they had was they had ABA-trained people and they had ABA-trained aides, they didn't call them therapists, that could assist in the classroom and they were public school employees, so you didn't need to have private ABA through a non-public agency, say, in the classroom. And there was really a big shift because districts, and this goes back to Andrew, districts didn't have to pull out all the stops and create a state-of-the-art, gold standard ABA program in their classrooms. They just had to offer at that time, you know, a, a level of, of intervention that would allow some progress from year to year. And not surprisingly, most of these district aides uh, were, were, you know, not very well trained, and they were being supervised by people that were not very well trained, and those cases became difficult to win. And so I think everybody would concede that what happened next was, you know, a lot of fighting and a lot of losing on the part of parents to get their ABA program from the outside into the classroom. But it was still happening a lot, and there were still a lot of fights because there was not any other way to get ABA in the classroom. So in 2012, I believe, in California, all of a sudden everything changed. So we've got a mandate that insurance had to cover, you know, state-funded plans regulated by the state of California had to cover ABA services with people with autism and as everybody knows there was no ceiling or no floor if you could get a diagnosis of autism you would qualify so then the the focus turned a lot to you know can i get my aba through my insurance in public school classrooms and it's still not happening very much but it is happening some and i say what's amazing is if you go to an iep where somebody else is paying for the aba Suddenly, the district is very cheery about it. They don't have any complaints. They don't have a bad attitude. And where we are right now, in my view, is it's very hard to get ABA of a meaningful type in the classroom. And when the school district says it's doing enough, I don't know what it's doing. 
but you know when I grew up you know once upon a time I was in frustration talking to Dr. Grandpache about you know what school districts were claiming they needed to do or that they did for kids with autism and she said Bonnie it's not that we don't know what to do for autism we know what works for autism that's not what's going on here and you know as obvious as that was a little light bulb went on in my head and I realized you know it's a money game and I'm too close to the situation because I believe so strongly mm -hmm in the ability of ABA to positively influence the life of a student and his or her family, that I'd sort of forgotten that it was just another, you know, money aspect of the autism wars. So when I come into these situations now, it's almost always not that the kid has no ABA, it's that the kid has something called ABA that isn't ABA. And that means they have an aide that maybe has a BA degree and maybe some minimal level of training and then some kind of, you know, supervision, maybe through somebody that the district's poached from a company that does ABA. So I want to get to your question about, you know, what it means when you say that the district says we're already doing enough. Well, you didn't tell us what they're doing, but I bet you anything, if you told me what they were doing, I'd be able to tear it apart. And that's kind of what has to happen at the IEP team. It's very unpleasant. There are strategic decisions you have to make, like should you have the person come into the classroom, the aide, so you can ask them lots of questions about their qualifications and show how unqualified they are. Um, but what you have to ask for is a functional behavior assessment. And you have to ask for it to be provided by somebody that's qualified, you know, is a BCBA and isn't biased, and is going to come in and honestly look at the situation and see how much off-task behavior your student has, how much, um, you know, how many uh, anti-learning behaviors your student has, how many stims your student has, and once all that data is collected, and again, there's a whole other chapter on this, which is the way the districts cut corners and do what they call an FBA that isn't an FBA. So you might have to challenge their FBA once it's done, but the point is a competent functional behavior assessment is going to demonstrate the need for ABA in most cases. Why do I say that? Because in, you know, I don't know, 95% of the cases, it's the treatment of choice for the individual in question. So a very long-winded way of telling you that we know what works for autism. We know that it's ABA in school. We know that the districts are playing a game when they say, the interventionists can only work on behavior, not academics, because we know that our kids have trouble with reading, they have trouble with math word problems, they have trouble with all kinds of things that behavior intervention can work on, and it's not limited to behavior. And the only way you're going to get this stuff in the classroom is, as I said, you're going to have a fight about the nature of the services they're providing versus what the literature says about what would make a difference for this person. So that's kind of what you'd need to do. If you don't agree with their functional behavior assessment, you could ask for an independent evaluation and get your own FBA in there. Um, I actually am just going to like pat myself on the back because I feel so smart about this. I ran into a therapist, a former card therapist, who worked with Nick when he was four at an IEP meeting about a year ago. And she now is a BCBA and she works for a very large district and she does functional behavior assessments for them. And I talked to her for a while and I figured out that this was somebody that had totally not sold out, was completely doing her job, and she gave me the verbiage that I needed to use so that if I asked for a district functional behavior assessment, I could get her as the person doing the assessment. And so I'm turning cartwheels about that because I just think it's such a great way to beat them at their own game. But that's, you know, that's that's some of the stuff that occurred to me when, when you posed the question, Shannon. Well, while you've been talking about this, Bonnie, a question came in on Facebook. And you can please be honest with me and tell, tell me if you'd rather leave this for next week. But I'm going to tell you what it is. It's a mom in Corpus Christi, Texas, who's writing in and saying I, that she would like for her daughter to be in general classes in public school 
or an adaptive ED because they currently have her in life skills and she's 13. I meant to, I meant to mention that because it was chunked in different parts. She's 13 years old. They have her in life skills with severe low functioning peers so she doesn't have enough social time. And she says she socializes better than most that are considered with low IDD. So um, would you like to leave that for next week or would you like to wait in on that now? Well, what is your question? I'm not clear. Well, I think it's how, how do you fight for, I mean, it sounds like an LRE question to me. How do you fight for if they've put some, you're, and we see this a lot, Bonnie, that they take kids that are teens and a little bit older and they stick them into life skills groups with kids <laughs> with other disabilities and, and basically they have them sorting nuts and bolts and, and not so really doing it. And, right. and so how do you get them back into general ed? How do you get the school to not give up on them? Did she say what the age of her child was? 13. 13. Okay. So here's the thing about that. Again, you're going to need an assessment. Look at the question of, of whether she can be educated in the least restrictive environment. You remember from prior shows that the presumption always is in favor of general ed. And then there's some balancing questions that are looked at. One is the social benefit to the child. Another is the educational. And the third is, is it disruptive? And in terms of the um, Can we, social benefit. That was just great, Bonnie. Can we go back over that again, the three considerations? Because I don't yeah, think I've maybe. ever heard that put so succinctly before. Can you say that again? Okay, this is essentially the Rachel Holland case in California. So the, the, the things that are looked at are the social benefit to the child, the educational benefit to the child and the disruption okay. to the rest of the class. So in Rachel Holland's case, I think she was a kindergartner and she had intellectual disability, but in, in kindergarten, the balance, the balancing was in favor of the social benefit and they felt that the academics weren't so hard that she was not going to be able to have modified work and she could keep up with the class. They said in that decision, as the child gets older, it's going to be, you know, more likely that the, the balance shifts in favor of um, a separate, you know, or segregated classroom for the academics because the academic need would be greater. Now, query whether there's any academic learning that goes on in special day classes. I mean, it's generally abysmal, but um, assuming that you're, you know, that the district could show that, that she's making more educational progress in the segregated classroom, they, they might be able to hang on to that. Now, if the student's disruptive and it can't be managed with an aid or other supports, that might also operate to, to take the person out of general ed earlier on. But usually where there's a will, there's a way. And if you really want a student to do general ed, which is what the law prefers, you know, you can pull out a lot of stops and put in a lot of supports and certainly for a while they can do it. Now, for the 13-year-old, one possibility would be to at least mainstream her with an aid for the non-academic portions of the day, or if there's any subject that she can do at, at grade level, maybe one of those classes. But it's going to be harder with a 13-year-old to make the argument that the social benefit is such that she needs to be mainstreamed because probably she's going to require, I don't know, but if she's going to require a tremendous amount of support and still not make much progress, in the general ed, then the, the social benefit argument is going to fail. But again, it all starts with an assessment. And in California, you would go and look and see whether there was a basis for challenging the assessment that was done most recently. And we've discussed before on the show, you can only challenge an assessment that's, you know, not yet two years old. So one year, 364 days or less. If, there's, if that assessment is deficient within the meaning of the law, you could get an outside evaluation paid for district expense. And one of the questions that the outside evaluator would look at is LRE. So, and for, and for our viewers who are not as jargon intensive as you, as you so, are and as I might be, LRE is? Least restrictive environment. 
and and all of our kids have a right to the least restrictive i always i'm always trying to memorize this language the least restrictive environment and in which there is a floor of opportunity to access the curriculum is that close to it well the least restrictive environment is always the presumption so you're supposed to look at that first on the continuum of options and and if you can be in the least restrictive environment and you can successfully access the curriculum with appropriate supports, then they have to give you that. So yeah, it's always gonna be looking at, the, uh, in other words, what the law wanted to do is get people out of their parents' basements, right. you know, and right. have them get into school. Right. It's an access kind of a, a thing. And so the presumption is you, you try to put the person in the most normative setting possible and you can't use a need for one-to-one -one support or accommodations as a reason to deny that. Um, but then if you do all that stuff and the student's still not making progress, you're going to have to modify the schedule. Right. The 13-year-old right. girl might try to sort of grab a little, you know, LRE at a time. In other words, make the case okay. for mainstreaming in non-academic times. And then if that all goes well, make the argument to try it in, you know, one academic class and so on. It sounds like a pretty abysmal situation and that the school isn't providing for any social skills, you know, clubs or anything during the week. I mean, we could also have a good laugh about social skills clubs in the public school because yeah. I could stand on my head for the half an hour a week that they do. And then, you know, I don't really know that much gets done. And then I could come out of my handstand and you go, go ahead <laughs> and go back to life because really nothing will have changed. I so, will I, say... I will say that since since social is what mom seems the most concerned about, there is a great group that is virally spreading that's Circle of Friends, that's a program. It, it sprang out of uh, the valley here in California, that that's something the mom can look and say to them, can you at least start this in the school? Because I, I, I think, you know, it's it's a little... That's a great what's that? I said, that sounds like a great suggestion. But I also this think... Is how, this is how the change has to occur, Shannon. It's yeah. never going to occur from the inside. But I that's so that. frustrating for me, though, Bonnie, that it seems like to me, because the, the law is written in such a way that it seems like, as a parent, you should be able to come to the table and say, I think that my kid can do that, uh, d do this. The assessment shows that my kid can probably do this. Let's try an aid and see if my kid can do it. But the presumption is always the other way. Uh, that, well, in fact it is, but legally it's not. Uh, but then you have to get litigious and it gets expensive and it gets drawn out and you lose time when that's happening. It, it makes me a little... Yeah, but you don't, want, you don't want to gain time that's not beneficial. What's that? You don't want to... You said you lose time, but I said you don't want to gain time that's not beneficial. That's I true. Mean, my, message, my message to everybody, and you know, it's not a happy message, is you probably want to get litigious because I don't see that much getting done without pushback. Yeah. And it doesn't, you, you know, oftentimes it doesn't happen at the IP level. Yeah. I think people have to be willing to contemplate being litigious. That's the only way we got ABA in the first place. Yeah. You know, I mean, from my standpoint. I will say this. I think that people understand that all people understand when, when there's no budge that you know our kids that are on the autism spectrum even i think in a lot of circumstances maybe not all i remember when my kid was little and if i would say no um but he he could hear if it was a conditional no right whereas if i said no and meant no to the core of my being he understood that right yeah. um and i think school districts understand that too and when they see and i know that they have conversations about okay this mom's not going to move so give her, give her what she wants because she's not going to move. She's got a lawyer. She means business. And we're not going to win this one. I, I think it's my presumption that they cave in a little bit more. And, and, and I do think that getting a lawyer and bringing a lawyer to an IEP sends a message that you're well, not going to budge. You know, one, one more time, I know it's heartbreaking, but it's simple economics. When you bring a lawyer to an IEP meeting, most districts are going to feel intimidated and then they're going to bring their lawyer, yeah. and their lawyer gets on the clock, and that becomes expensive. And so, you know, certain districts will say, well, maybe we can avoid this, and that's when the real discussion begins. I mean, in situations, rare situations, 
such as one that I'm involved in right now, where district staff talk freely to parents about how upset they are about what the administration is doing or not doing, it's exactly like the com kind of conversations we have. They right. say, you know, like, people are lazy, they don't do anything, they make promises, they don't keep them, they only respond, you know, in a crisis. I mean, we could have a whole other discussion on why special ed ruins administrators who start out as, you know, dedicated, caring people, but that's a separate discussion. Yeah. Just assume that the administration you're going to have to deal with is so cost-constrained that they can't have an honest dialogue with you. Yeah. When you're in that situation, they're primed to respond to economic threats, and they do respond to them. Which all so comes back to the fact that special education has never been fully funded. That goes to the federal government. Right. And, you know, uh, Jeff Sessions came out very publicly and said that that is one of the great shames that, that how could people be expected to follow through on something if it hadn't been fully funded? And, you know, so we say hopefully somebody will buy a vowel in the federal government. Bonnie, we yeah. ate up all of your time. That's good. That's okay. what we're supposed to do. Okay, great. Well, I appreciate you more than you could possibly ever know. Uh, we just adore you. And again, tell us how we can get a hold of Hirji and Chow. Uh, Hirji and Chow. Hirji and Chow is in Culver City. Our telephone number is 310-391-0330. I'd love to have a conversation with you about your specific problem if you have one and you think it's time. Fabulous. Thank you so All much, right. Bonnie. I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you. All right, Will take do. care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to be back with Lee Grossman. He is an amazing dad, an amazing advocate, who has been in the autism community for quite a while, has wealth of knowledge, working on some really important stuff. It's going to be a great interview. Don't go anywhere. Potty training is different for every child. A child could come in with absolutely, you know, no control over their bladder, and as long as that's not a medical issue, then we can certainly approach it behaviorally and give them the tools they need to be successful, you know, just like any other skill that we would teach. Well, we think he's learning to pee on the potty. No big successes yet and lots and lots of accidents. Here is the laundry from today. For some of our kids, it takes you know, just a couple days. And then for other kids, it can take months and months and months. And then when you're looking at complete independence, it can take years. Hey, you have to go pee-pee? No. There's a lot of different ways to tell if a child is ready. We look for a couple different things. Um, probably the most important is parents saying, I need this to happen, I'm ready. The second is you know, a child showing interest in the bathroom. And some of it is simply age. It's time to go ahead and, and work on this. You're pooping? You first start with teaching the child what they need to do on the toilet. The basic thing we want is for them to drink as much liquid as possible. It's inevitable that if you drink a bunch of liquid, you're gonna pee. Help. No, no, you, no, I can't help you pee. Help. I can hold your hand, but I can't help you pee. Ultimately, what we want is that, you know, the child, as soon as they're put on the toilet, they urinate. So that's step one. Step two is usually um, working through the amount of time that they're off of the toilet and making sure that they're not having accidents during the time that they're off. So this is kind of the bladder control stage of things. So the purpose of the potty log is just to see how long it takes them as soon as they sit on the potty for them to actually urinate and the amount of time that um, he's able to hold his urine. And with the log, we're able to visually see how long it takes them each time, and if they have the accidents or not. He's on a half hour potty schedule, so if he doesn't go when we take him, then we have to take him in 10 more minutes. So every 10 minute intervals until he does go, and then we reset the clock, and it's 30 minutes again. Okay, buddy, okay, last chance, last chance to go pee-pees. Do we reset it for 10? What we hope happens in this time is that the kids will learn how to initiate going to the bathroom on their own. This is 
oftentimes the hardest part of potty training is because they get so used to somebody telling them when they need to go that they're not really recognizing the signs just in their own body of when they need to go. Oh, he wet himself. Uh-oh. Oh. Big wet? Was it a lot? <laughs> we can reset to half an hour now. The biggest thing for parents is not to give up. The other big tip, and I think pitfall that a lot of parents fall into, is putting their children back into pull-ups or diapers, especially if they're starting to have accidents. And this is probably the worst thing that you can do. They need to recognize that feeling of fullness in their bladder and take themselves to the bathroom or tell an adult that they need to go to the bathroom. What do you have to do? You have to put your pee-pee in the potty. Okay, give it a shot. See if you guys put it in there. There you go. There you go. You're doing it. Yay. Hey, Jack. Hey, great for your pee-pee. Big yeah. pee-pee. Welcome back to Autism Live. We're very excited because the first time here on the show, we have the amazing Lee Grossman. He is joining us via Skype. And Lee, I'm so excited to have you on the show because we have, you know, it's hard to even pinpoint how to introduce you because you've done so many things in this community. Uh, and we're going to try to get to as many of them as we can in the time that we've got here. But you have been a leader in the autism community for a very long time. Um, and, and have played many different roles. Uh, so I want to start by welcoming you and say, how did this start? How did the collaboration between Lee Grossman and autism, how did this all come to be? Well, Shannon, I, I first want to say thank you for having me on your program. I find your program to be inspirational and informative, and you're providing a wonderful service to, to the autism you. community. Thank you so much. Um, how did I get started in autism the way most parents do? Where I'm a parent of a, of a, of a child with autism. He's now 30 years old. I, I can't believe it. Uh, a wonderful, wonderful child. Love him dearly. And uh, uh, that's how I got started. And, and, and that's you know that that makes began. you officially one of the pioneers, that we have, we, we have certain parents that we look up to and we say, you know, they're the pioneers. They're the ones that forged the way for the rest of us. Because 30 years ago when your child was diagnosed, it was, there was pretty much nothing. Am I correct? Yeah, well, there was nothing. Uh, there was very little. And particularly where I lived at the time, which was uh, in Hawaii, there was virtually nothing. Um, I, I, I will take some umbrage with you on this pioneer uh, <laughs> label that you've uh, put on me because I, I feel as though what I was able to accomplish was because I was able to uh, be carried on the shoulders of true pioneers that were in the field, which I, I in, in my journey, was very fortunate to become friends with, to learn from, and to work side by side with them. And uh, it was it was uh, with a great deal of gratitude that I have uh, for them and for what they were able to accomplish. Uh, people including like uh, Bernie Rimland, uh, Eric Schopler, uh, uh, Ruth Sullivan. Uh, these are are true pioneers and heroes of the autism community that have done so much for all of us that have bettered the lives of, of, of everybody on the planet today with autism. When I started with my journey, uh, I really didn't know where to go. It, it took uh, such a long time for him, for my child to be even diagnosed. Um, it, it, uh, we knew something was wrong. And uh, uh, I went with my two boys uh, on a uh, summer vacation and uh, to spend some time with my sister uh, on the East Coast, and she happens to be a psychologist. And when I returned back to Hawaii, there was a letter. These are back in the days where we still wrote letters. Uh, <laughs> there was a letter waiting for me uh, from her uh, that was beautifully written and basically threatening me that if I didn't do something for my son, uh, my second son, uh, she was going to step in and take him away from me. Um, because at that time, he was such a lovely child, so personable, so friendly, that we were hearing 
from doctors when I say, do you think anything's wrong with him? And they go, oh, no, no, he's a lovely child. He'll, he'll grow out of this. And uh, that really is what spurred me to go and start to investigate further what um, uh, what perhaps is, is uh, going on with him. Well, I got to stop you for a second, though, because people ask all the time, what do you do when you see a parent who's in denial? And for your sister to say, you need to do something or I'm going to do something and potentially even take your child away, I, I hear that it spurred you into action, but were, okay. were, are you still speaking? And, and was, was that something that you now look at and go, thank goodness she did that, or do you wish she'd taken a different tact? I have her letter in my, dress, in my desk drawer here. I've, I've, I've saved that letter. Uh, it was what I needed to hear. Uh, and I have been very blunt in, uh, uh, in the times that I've talked to parents that I believe are in denial. Uh, they have to hear the story. They have to get started. They have to move forward. Um, in the positions that I've held over the years uh, into autism, I've been incredibly fortunate to, to talk with thousands, literally thousands of clinicians and parents and individuals with autism. And... Um, uh, and what I found is that sometimes you just have to be direct and to, and not only being direct, but to, to hold their hand to guide them because that's what happened to me. I went and started this journey meeting with all the, the, the best of the best doctors as they were described to me in Hawaii to try to get some sort of diagnosis uh, for my son. And uh, it, it was a very distressing uh, period where, I would walk into one doctor's office and they'd say, oh, he's fine. He'll grow out of it. Einstein didn't talk till he was four years old. And then I remember very vividly on December 31st of 1990, uh, getting the results uh, on my son from the person that was described as the best child psychologist in the state, telling me to my fa face that uh, I should institutionalize him and throw away the keys and get on with my life. Wow. Uh, I literally walked up to his desk, took the file, and asked him, are you, reading, are you sure you have the right file? Um, it was a, a very distressing time, as you can imagine, as we went through this. Um, fortunately, I had this sister who said, you know, you might want to look into this thing that I heard in my readings called PDD. I don't really know what it's about, but, you know, it's kind of related to autism, and I ended up going to the library, which is what you did in the early 90s. You couldn't get on the Internet and look these things up. And I took out of the Hawaii State Library as many books as I could uh, that had the subject of autism in it, which was four books. <laughs> and um, I remember reading those and uh, seeing for the first time uh, in, in very clear detail uh, what my son had, and that was autism. Uh, it was many, many months later, uh, again, kind of forcing myself uh, in to see Dr. Eric Schopler in North Carolina at uh, Division Teach at the University of North Carolina and uh, taking my son there because nobody would diagnose my son with autism. And I kept talking to the doctors in Hawaii about this. You know, Do you think it's autism? Oh, no, no, no. He's too nice. He's too friendly. Um, they really didn't associate... Uh, uh, their typical description was that he had to have very negative uh, behavioral characteristics, which he really didn't display. And it wasn't until that time that I went to U University of North Carolina to Chapel Hill uh, and met with Dr. Eric Schopler. In the first 30 seconds that he met with Vance, he said he's autistic. And that was the first time from a professional that I heard that diagnosis for him. And it was a very moving experience for me. And uh, Eric and I became very dear friends. And... Uh, through that experience, I was able to mimic what Division Teach was doing and convince the Department of Education in Hawaii to begin uh, to, to develop two Division Teach type classrooms, which, uh, um, which benefited many, many uh, of the students in Hawaii. Uh, if anybody was a pioneer, he referred to me as a pioneer, it was my son. My son was one of the first kids in Hawaii that got exposed to Division Teach, that got exposed to ABA, uh, auditory integrated training, uh, speech therapy, occupational therapy, really the, the whole gamut of, uh, of services that really didn't exist uh, uh, prior to uh, Vance's diagnosis. 
and and uh, he was the pioneer uh, for many of these services that were brought into the state and uh, have remained since. Um, I d but I just want to say, credit where credit is due, you were an integral part about making that happen. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been. And and so when I say pioneer, I mean it in the in the most in the nicest, most respectful term that there there are so many of us who are following and have been following in your snowshoes. And that and because you started a path that we then follow. And I'm wondering, Lee, you know, first there's the the devastation of your child is diagnosed, but at what point did you really get it that not only were you gonna have to deal with that, but you were going to have to be a part of creating something that didn't exist. Because you know, there are parents right now who who get the diagnosis and and even now with everything that there is, they are at sea. And I it's so interesting to me to watch that progression for when a parent suddenly goes, Oh, I'm gonna have to help be a part of the change that comes next. When did that happen for you? When did you get it that, oh, I'm not just gonna be able to let this be, I'm gonna have to grow something? Well, it, it, uh, and that's an excellent question because I remember explicitly how that happened. Um, I, uh, as I was going through, again, this journey and finally had this, uh, this diagnosis of autism, I had heard, I, I think I saw a flyer uh, on a bulletin board at one of the local grocery stores that, talked, that said there's an autism society of Hawaii and that they had this meeting at a church that was actually fairly close to my house. And I walked in there to one of the meetings, and uh, the first meeting uh, that I attended, and I really have to say that I had a chip on my shoulder. I was a real uh, jerk. Uh, I thought I knew everything. I thought that uh, uh, there wasn't anything that these people could help me with or tell me about. And I had already heard it. I, I'd been through the ups and very, very low downs um, on this journey and uh, felt that they couldn't help me or, or say anything. I, I really did come in there with a bad attitude. And uh, within five minutes, that all changed. These people uh, uh, reached out their arms. They reached out their hearts. They took me under their uh, shoulders. And when I say about the pioneering and the work that we did in Hawaii, it was because of these people and working with them and following their leads and, and, and all of us working together that we were able to accomplish uh, what we were able to do. And understanding and realizing at that point that there was a community here that, that we could work with, that we could work together to create what ne was needed, not only for my son and for my family, but for all of us. And it was at that point that I knew and decided that I had to be a, a strong advocate uh, for my son and, and, and committed to do so. Uh, it, it was it was kind of that point where in of inflection where I, I felt like, oh, woe is me, oh, I'm so terrible and this is so hard, that I said, wow, I can finally do something and I can make things happen and I can change them, and uh, that was a very very important part uh, uh, of uh, of my process, and I've seen that as the turning point for many families, for many parents, when they make that decision instead of uh, of carrying a, a burden. To, to, to be proactive and to be assertive and to be somewhat aggressive in terms of getting the services that are so necessary for their child. Yeah, it, it, I, I totally agree. It is so much easier to be in action than it is to be in grief and, and all the other mm -hmm. things that can come along with this. But Lee, how did you get from there, from saying, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a difference and I'm here at this meeting to becoming the president of the largest grassroots parent organization in the history of autism, the Autism Society of America. How did you get there? Well, um, within about six months, I, yeah, this is part of a whole progression, within about six months of, of walking in that door of the Autism Society of uh, Hawaii, I became the president of the chapter. And uh, it, was, it was at a very, very important inflection point in the history of Hawaii. Hawaii was rated as having the worst special ed system in, in the country. And um, uh, we uh, formed a coalition with many of the other uh, uh, organizations in, in, the, in the state of Hawaii and, uh, and filed a class action lawsuit against the state in federal court. 
uh, it turned out that that was the largest, I think even t today, the largest class action suit of its kind ever filed. Um, and it was, uh, it, the, the points of it were primarily that the state was not in compliance with Section 504 and IDEA. Um, after many months of, uh, of negotiation and court and, and trial, trial dates, the, uh, the state was forced to uh, enter into a consent decree where they admitted and the, and the federal judge said that they were in criminal, that there was criminal neglect that the state had done in servicing special ed students in the state of Hawaii. And uh, the, the Autism Society of Hawaii was one of the two organizational uh, 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 plaintiffs in the case. And by virtue of the fact that I was the president at the time, that kind of put me on, on, that, on the stage uh, to be very forefront on that. And through that experience, I, I guess I developed uh, uh, somewhat of a national reputation uh, uh, and was asked to speak at many uh, national conferences. Our, our chapter, and this is the work of some very great people uh, that was in our chapter, also organized some very innovative, uh, state-of-the-art um, uh, autism conferences. And maybe it's because we were in Hawaii, but we were able to attract <laughs> the leaders in the field to come to Hawaii on a fairly regular basis to uh, present to the community and the Department of Education and, and, and many other people there. Uh, Bernie Rimland and I became very dear friends, and Bernie used to love to come to Hawaii to talk, uh, so that was always an easy ask uh, to have him. And it was really through these experiences that I got to be known. I, I, I went to my first uh, Autism Society of America National Conference in 1992, very serendipitously started talking to some people. Uh, as I was registering, they invited me to dinner. I was there by myself. It was actually in Toronto, Canada. And the dinner that they invited me to was the dinner for the board of directors of the Autism Society of America. So w without even knowing, I was there talking to them and made some very, very good close friendships. And within uh, a year, I was on some committees for ASA. And then in 1995, I was elected to the board of ASA and served in that capacity until I became the uh, chair of the board in 2001. Uh, and that's kind of how I rose, I guess, through the ranks, so to speak. Well, and I and think you're very modest. I think that they looked at you and clearly you are a mover and a shaker. Clearly you are somebody who gets it done and you're so eloquent and so well-spoken. Well and this was personal for you. And so you get it when it's personal to other people. But I think we all recognize a leader when we see one, and I think they certainly saw that in you very quickly. Uh, and so, you know, there have been so many ways that you've been able to impact uh, the autism community. And I, we could talk for four hours just about your time at Autism Society of America, but what, if there was one thing that you wanted to point to while you were there that you feel good in your bones about what what do you think is something that you uh that you feel good about that happened while you were there well there were so many um i i, I would i okay th there are many uh, uh were some of the things i'm very proud of is the fact that the autism society came out very strongly and actually pushed forward uh in 2006 a uh, uh a um uh, project that identified the rise in autism squarely uh, related to environmental factors, and we and we had an initiative uh, regarding uh, environmental factors as as a major contributor to autism. Uh, I, I think that changed the paradigm in in the way that we talk about autism, uh, because at that time it was kind of taboo to even go in that direction. But within a year or so, the federal government was saying that environmental factors play a role in the rise of, uh, of autism. And even about two months ago, there was a recent article, a uh, 120-page uh, paper uh, that was uh, published by the EPA and the National Institutes of Environmental Health Services on environmental factors related to all chronic health conditions. And in it, it said that about 60 to 70 percent of the uh, factors related to uh, somebody getting autism are environmentally related. So I'm very, very proud of that. Uh, one of the other things that I was uh, very proud of uh, was the fact that we identified the, the primary crisis in autism 
is adult services or the lack thereof of adult services. Um, and realizing, understanding, and identifying that these children grow up and they're going to spend the majority of their lives as adults. And there's very, very little services or attention that's paid towards that. And adult services, they inherit all the failures of the previous systems that these kids have gone through. So I was very proud that we were able to bring that to the forefront. I think that my that one of the, the thing that I'm most proud of uh, when I was at the Autism Society was that we would not allow a committee, a panel, a board, um, a project, uh, anything to uh, to be formed unless there was a, a person with autism that was there as a peer as an advisor, at the same level as everybody else, to be involved in that project. Uh, we wanted to not only talk the talk, we wanted to walk the walk, and that was really based maybe on my own prejudice, that I have learned more about autism from people with autism, and felt that by not having their voice there, and not having them in these leadership positions, and not hearing from them, and having them help us direct and, and guide us through this, was 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 a was a missed opportunity, a, a massive scale. Uh, so we made that a policy, and uh, and have held and at the time I helped to it because it was very very important. And the organization grew and benefited significantly by having individuals with autism in leadership positions, playing uh, in a very very important role in every part of our activities. I absolutely yeah, agree. Absolutely. I think we should take a short uh, break and then we want to come back and talk about some of the things that you're working on right now. You brought up environmental yeah. and we're going to talk about P2I and the forum, uh, all of which are going to blow some people's minds. So everybody stick with us. We'll be right back after these messages. Is that your smile? I've been looking at you forever, yet I never saw you before. I beat your head. As a celebrity, whatever that means, you want to do what you can to get back. The way I've always looked at it, if I'm available, I'm going to be there. And when you get there and you see what folks are doing and the lives that they're touching, how can you not want to continue? And for the first time, I am looking in your mind. What can we all do to make a difference? Not only with trying to find the cure, but to help the children and the families that may not have the resources for these kids. When you're looking back at me, now I understand what... And none of us are doing enough, but I think that we're doing as much as we possibly can. Because we all live in society, and the more we can all do to help society, the more it helps all of us. Yeah. And for the first time, I am looking in your eyes. And for the first time, I'm seeing who you are. I can't believe how much I see. Now I understand what love is, love is, for the first time. Welcome back to Autism Live. We are continuing our conversation with Lee Grossman, who has been such an influence in the autism community uh, over the last 30 years. We're thrilled to be talking with him. And Lee, I wanted to talk a little bit about, we, we've talked about how you became part of the autism community and were such a force as the president of the Autism Society of America, but your role has shifted significantly. And one of the things that you're uh, involved in right now. We've talked a little bit on the show before about P2I, but we might have new viewers who haven't heard about it, and something called the Forum. So uh, I, I very briefly, I'd like for you to give us the master class on what this is and why you're so interested and involved with, with these projects. Well, I'm on the board of directors of the Forum Institute, 
And the forum uh, is an organization that's based out of Portland, Oregon. Uh, the, uh, you've had on your program before Dave Humphrey, who's the chair of the board of the Forum Institute. And it is an um, uh, organization that's been very significant in, um, in leading some uh, major initiatives forward in, in autism. Uh, for example, uh, the predecessor to the forum, really essentially the same board as what's there now, is the group that founded, started, and funded the Autism Treatment Network, which is the largest uh, program uh, among, uh, uh, among uh, multi-hospital multi or medical center-based uh, programs in the world. Uh, it's now, that's now a project of Autism Speaks and continues and remains very successful. Um, They've also, the forum is also responsible for, they, they help fund and uh, perpetuate our information at ASA uh, with the environmental project that we had. Uh, uh, the forum also was the impetus behind the GI and autism uh, public consensus document that was published in the Journal of Pediatrics that uh, really uh, established uh, the G GI problems and autism are put it into the mainstream. Uh, and uh, two years ago, the uh, forum published a, another major consensus conference uh, 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 journal um, paper in the Journal of, uh, of uh, Pediatrics. And this was on early, uh, early diagnosis and early intervention. Uh, so it's a group that I'm very, very proud to be involved with. Our major initiative right now is this initiative called P2I, which is preconception through in infancy. Preconception meaning that before uh, a couple even, uh, during the time that they're considering having a child, what is it that they need to do so that that child can be, uh, can be healthy? And the science behind this basically states that if uh, prior to a, a woman getting pregnant, if you look at the health issues that she's uh, that she's faced with, and you address those health issues and make her as healthy as possible, then the chances of her having a full-term birth with a healthy child, having that pregnancy go well, uh, those uh, percentages greatly improve. Uh, the United States today has among some of the worst outcomes. In, uh, in, in health related to pregnancy and uh, childbirth uh, in the developed world. And it's our objective with the P2I program is to change that directory and improve the outcomes, not only in the U.S., but around the world. Um, we uh, have developed a, a unique way of testing uh, the families prior to uh, the woman becoming pregnant, testing her through the pregnancy, uh, testing her after birth and the infant, uh, and it's our intent through our program to n follow that family from the preconception period through the first five years of the child's life, assuring that they have that they're healthy, uh, addressing uh, any environmental factors that they've been exposed to, uh, and uh, recommending any interventions that need to be done. It's 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 based on information and science that is already well recognized and that there's consensus around. What has not happened is that there hasn't been a project to consolidate that information and put it into practice. And we've developed a relationship with uh, others so that we can take that information uh, as the data is coming out. We're seeing uh, families and women through uh, the clinic take that information, evaluate the outcomes, and, and as we believe that they're going to show that the outcomes improve, that we'll have a direct pipeline to introduce our results uh, into the public health service so that, it, so that this well-known information is, uh, then, uh, is then included in, in all the practices around the U.S. and, and around the world. And it's I, a very, very exciting project. It, we it feel is. it's going to transform healthcare because the chronic health conditions that a person has across their lifespan Many of them are embedded at the, before the child is even conceived because they're carried on from generation to generation. So if we can find uh, those before a woman even gets pregnant and address those, then, then the chances of that child uh, having a healthier life are greatly improved. 
And there is, in fact, already data from P2I that is that shows that there's every reason to be, because you're involved in bigger studies now, but there's every reason to believe that the bigger studies are going to replicate what the smaller group studies have shown, which is that you can make a tremendous difference. And I think it's important for people yeah. to know that it isn't, it isn't just talking about autism, but that when the mother is healthy, as you said, the, the baby is healthier and there are significantly fewer incidences of all of the major childhood diseases, including pediatric cancer, pediatric diabetes. Uh, you know, it's, I get very excited when you and Dave Humphrey talk about these kinds of things because this is where we have to go. And I, I'm, I, I always want to talk about P2I because I think that this is, when, when we go to the general public talking about autism, they want to know, what do I need to know? Because they would like to make sure that they have the healthiest child possible. Mm -hmm. And I don't think this information gets to them enough, although you and I are both trying to get this information to people, that there are ways and studies being done that are showing that you can have an impact on the health of your child. Uh, that's part of our, our project is that we will have, uh, and at the time that we launch it, and we're hoping that we can launch the clinic uh, in about six months. At the same time that we're launching the clinic, we're going to have a very, very engaging virtual campus that will have the information that we'll be delivering in the clinic available to anybody that wants to access it. Uh, there'll be uh, studies in there showing the proof of concept uh, the fact that in 2006 the CDC published um, a, a significant uh, paper showing that this process that we are implementing uh, will work, and it's been that has been cited in over 350 peer review articles since then. Uh, so this is not anything new. This is basically just taking the information out there and consolidating it. So when we have that campus, uh, the virtual campus set up, people will have access to what the professionals are saying. There'll be uh, uh, online communities there for, uh, for families and uh, to share information or, or to, to get information. Um, we we want to democratize this process. This is not information that should be held to a few. This should be information that everybody on the planet knows and has access to. And that's part of what we, what we intend to do. And where can people go for more information before the campus, the virtual campus, is set up? Well, right now we have a mock website up. It's not, uh, there is a little bit of information, and it's p2iforum.com. And so there is some information av available there, just kind of with the concept. Please understand that that website is very much in, in its draft phase and is not completed. So, uh, but there is information there uh, in terms of, uh, the uh, uh, papers that we're referencing, like the CDC's paper and what this is based on, this, the science behind P2I. Okay. Science. It's all very fascinating. And I do want to say that we're having Dave uh, Humphrey on the show next week. So he's going to give oh. us some more information about this as well. Okay. Um, but I want to move on because we're running out of time and we are going to have to have you back on the show, but we're running out of time. And I want to talk a little bit about having had this perspective and being in this community for 30 years uh, almost, what I want to talk about what have you learned? First of all, what have you learned as a dad? Yeah. Well, um, I've, I, what I've learned is that it, it, just to be a parent of a child with autism is that you have to have patience beyond that of a saint. Uh, you have to have detective skills beyond that of Sherlock Holmes. And uh, you have to have tenacity that is greater than any pit bull that you've ever met. Uh, those three characteristics are what a, a, a parent of autism has to have uh, to, to advocate and to improve the life of their child. What I've learned over the years is that this is an amazingly warm and loving and wonderful community. People that are dedicated, our normal, our, our daily life, our normal is, is not one that any other uh, group can understand and uh, it's for that reason and for just the fact that we have to stick together and learn from each other and work together that makes us a very very uh, strong uh, uh, and, and very very moving uh, community uh, for me to work with I've been uh, very grateful for uh, for this experience and uh, for, for what I've learned from 
the families and from the clinicians and, and certainly from the individuals with autism. Um, there's much to be done. Uh, the things that I hear on your program and, and read about on a daily basis about some of the battles that are being fought out there are the battles that I fought, that have been fought before uh, before I, I was fighting them. And it, it really is a shame how at, at times we have to fight the medical community, the school districts, et cetera, to get the services that are so necessary for, for, our, for our children. But yet we fight, we must. And the adult service sector is still woefully, woefully uh, behind and, uh, and uh, not really servicing our, our kids to, to the level that uh, they need it and that the families need it. Uh, uh, I've learned a lot. There are, uh, I'm always looking for solutions. Solutions are far and few be in between. Uh, there are some uh, that I feel uh, are happening. I, I believe that we've made great strides with wandering. My son used to wander. It's something that's very, very personal to me because of uh, the fear that I still sometimes live with and thinking about the times that he disappeared uh, while we were out and uh, how he would he how he would lope. And the fact that I had attended too many funerals of, of, uh, of children that, that, that had uh, wandered off and, and had a terrible end. Uh, so we do have solutions to those now, I, I believe, uh, with some of the GPS devices that are there. And I'm working with a, a company now to help to develop that, not, not to keep the kids in prison, but to develop this as a, as a program so that the child can, can develop greater generalization and independence uh, and, and the family still having that safety and security of knowing where they are and what they're doing. And uh, to me, I wouldn't be involved with this if it meant that the kid was going to be further imprisoned and, and held. Uh, I, I'm involved with this because I believe that this is an opportunity to really allow the kids, and, and, and wish I wish I would have had for my son, to allow him to go out and explore, to learn, you know, to, to fail and to succeed and, and to recreate in the community uh, in ways that uh, are now only available uh, uh, for these children. Um, I think that we can do a lot more um, on the adult uh, employment situation. Uh, most people with autism, uh, and I do say most, and when I do say most, I'm talking almost 100%, are employable. And uh, we uh, should be taking advantage of the skills that they have to offer to, uh, to our communities and, and, and to employers. And uh, that hasn't been done, but I, I do see some movement there. I do see some uh, projects that are starting, and I could talk about those through much greater detail on, on, a, on a future show of, uh, of where some of these opportunities are opening up, where corporations are, are beginning to find the benefits of having a person with autism be, be an employee. An employee. Uh, so there are things that are happening that I'm very, very positive about. Uh, one of the things that I, I will emphasize is that uh, our system, our, 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 uh, the, the, the strides that we've made and with the meager process that, that has been made over the years uh, in developing services and supports for our, uh, for our kids, they're under attack now. And I can't emphasize it enough. Uh, enough. Uh, so it really behooves parents and the professional community and the organizations to, to perhaps even come, not advocates anymore, but to become activists. We have to be very, very strong in letting our uh, politicians, our regulators, those in power know how important these services are to us and how they can't, can't be stripped away. We fought too hard to get to this point and that we even need more. And uh, when I hear on a daily basis that these services are under attack and, and are threatened to be removed. Uh, it, it really brings out the activist spirit in me, and it's one that I hope that others will follow because we need to have our voices strongly heard right now so that, so that we don't lose what, we, what we've gained and perhaps that so we can even gain a little bit more. Well, amen to that, Lee. I, I, I've appreciated everything you've said. We are going to have to have you back on a show because there's just so much more to talk about, but this has been so lovely to have this opportunity to have you share your experience and, and your knowledge. It's just uh, very exciting. And I know 
it's, we're, it's always great to hear from an autism dad and from somebody who's had such a wealth of experience. So we thank you. We're, unfortunately, we're out of time, but we thank you so much, and we'll look forward to having you back on the show again. Thank you, Shannon. I appreciate it very much. Thank you My so much. My best to you and to all your listeners. Thank you. Bye-bye for now. Uh, right. And I want to say to everybody, we really were, we're like uh, seconds away from being over time. But we are back here on Wednesday. We've got some really exciting shows for you and potentially some, uh, we will be back on Wednesday and Thursday. We might even have a little bit of live coverage on Thursday, maybe. I don't know. It's something that I can't talk about yet. Um, but anyway, I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank all my fabulous guests. I hope you guys have a great weekend. Uh, I'll see you back on Wednesday. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now.